Can you hear me? Is it better? Is it better? Huh? Static, yeah. I think the HTML. But can the people in the back hear me? I can talk. Okay. Hi everyone, um, I hope people can still hear me in the back. So as Praveen said, uh, my lab mostly is interested in three major aspects of research. We are interested in understanding how ecology and evolution shape venoms. So basically extensive factors like diet, predator pressures, competition, social structure, ontogeny and so on. And we are also interested in understanding how molecular and evolutionary mechanisms shape animal venoms. And of course, the last aspect, which I'll not talk about today, is uh, snake, you know, snake bite therapeutics. So the uh, treatment for snake bites is not very effective in India. So we are also striving to develop uh, advanced uh, therapies for treating snake bites. So just a uh, primer for venoms. Um, so how do you distinguish venoms and poisons? Venoms are actively injected by an uh, organism in order to secure a meal or to defend itself, right? Whereas poisons are passively administered, so either through secretion on the skin. Um, so various animals have evolved very different mechanisms of injecting venom, right? So for example, you have snakes, you have lizards. Um, So you have snakes, you have lizards, which make use of their fangs or teeth, modified teeth, to inject venom. Uh, uh, spiders also do that, they also have fangs. Then you have animals like scorpions that make use of these stingers to inject venom. And you have this uh, unique phyla called, phyla, uh, phyla called uh, uh, cnidaria, with, which uh, inject venom using these cnidocytes. And uh, you have cone, uh, cone snails that make use of these harpoon-like structures to inject venom. So cone snails, as you know, I mean, un un unlike the terrestrial snakes, they feed on you know insect uh, mollusks. They feed on insects also, and mostly fishes. So poisons can only harm you if you ingest them or if it is absorbed or inhaled through the skin, right? So if something bites you and you fall sick or die, that's a venomous animal. And if you bite something and you die or fall sick, that's a poisonous animal. Venoms are complex, right? So they are not made up of just a single protein, but they are made up of, uh, uh, you know, large number of proteins. Uh, so it's a complex cocktail. Uh, each of these proteins can be very small molecules, like the ones you find in cone, uh, cone snails or in scorpions, for example. Um, but you also have really large ones, like in some spiders, which are over thousand amino acids in uh, length, right? And they can act as, I mean, they can exist as monomers or they can dimerize to form these complex uh, dimers and multiples. What is fascinating is venom has evolved independently in the animal kingdom. So as you know, the common ancestor of anim all animals was not venomous, right? So all these venoms evolved at these, uh, you know, tips, right? So you can see the lineages that are marked in red. These are the ones that have evolved venom to capture prey and you have lineages that are marked in uh, blue, which are the ones that use venoms for defensive purposes. And you will also see some that have both red and blue, right? So they make use of the venom for both uh, defense and offense. So venom has evolved at least 100 different times in the animal kingdom. And in contrast to, um, you know, the popular belief, not only animals that uh, are medically important to humans are venomous, but also those that make use of uh, various cocktails of proteins to interfere with the blood coagulation cascade and feed on uh, the blood, right? So for example, you have vampire bats, you have pigs, you have lampreys. So 
as i told you earlier they may reactively inject the venom or this complex cocktail of proteins to interfere with the target in order to facilitate their feeding or defense right so um evolutionary definition of venom these animals are also venomous so venom has nothing to do with humans and uh, which will you'll see in a bit very uh, very clearly so despite evolving over 100 different times you can see the evolutionary convergence in the targets right so all of them um, have evolved abilities to target almost identical receptors in their prey or predators why is that because these are conserved receptors right so if you target them then uh, some of them can make use of these broad uh, uh, i mean they can capture broad variety of prey and defend themselves from a wide variety of predators right so so they can target the coagulation cascade you know all these are uh, different uh, uh, molecules that are involved in blood coagulation or they can target the neuronal pathway or the nervous system right that's how they paralyze so if you look at this um you know the cone snail right so this is an amazing creature and you'll see how many different targets it is uh, you know it is uh, how many molecules it is targeting basically so presynaptic sodium channels postsynaptic sodium channels it can block them it can prolong them right um then uh, it can target potassium channels it can target calcium channels nicotinic uh, choline receptors and so on so why does one animal evolve so many different components to target so many different receptors right i mean it could have just targeted one and done a better job at it uh, it wouldn't have uh, needed to spend that extra energy to produce so many other molecules right so you can think of it is uh, in two ways one is that imagine what will happen if the prey or the predator evolves resistance to that particular receptor uh, i mean toxin right then basically the venom is rendered uh, inert so that's why it targets multiple things the other amazing thing about targeting multiple receptors is something called uh, cabals so before that so you all remember action potential right so action potential starts from one end and propagates to the other end and this happens because of opening and closing of two important channels right the sodium and potassium channels so you have the sodium channels that open up and sodium ions uh you know they move in move into the cell right and at the same time potassium ion channels open up and the potassium ions move out so this is very important for the propagation of the action potential right so what cone snails do is they have these complex cocktails like i told you right uh, different components that target a variety of channels so let's just look at two different toxins that uh, cone snails produce one is called a delta toxin that binds to the sodium ion channel and it prevents it from closing so the sodium ions keep moving in and at the same time you have other toxins like i said like this one is called a kappa toxin because it targets the uh, potassium ion channel and it blocks the channel so the, there is no movement inward movement of potassium ion. so what happens the action potential continues right in either direction so binding of toxins is random so it can bind at different places so depending on what toxin has bound you will see something like this right so it's like taking an electric uh, gun and zapping the fish so when this happens the fish becomes incapacitated in a matter of seconds so if you look at cone snails uh, feeding on fish you can see that the cone snail takes a long time to move right uh, so it has to incapacitate the fish in a matter of seconds and it achieves it by targeting different components so one of the other important reasons why animals produce multiple toxins is they can incapacitate the prey or predator in a much much more efficient manner so you you could you can already tell why animal venoms are such an amazing systems to study evolution uh, i mean question i guess questions in evolutionary biology in particular right they are complex they have evolved independently and uh, they have these amazing specificity to various receptors and the prey and predators also evolve resistance so it's an amazing system and one of the most interesting questions in evolutionary biology is to understand the evolution of traits right especially adaptive traits so venom is an adaptive trait uh, so tracing where did this uh, uh, particular trait evolved is um, you know a fascinating aspect which i find very interesting so let's look at um, you know the snakes right i mean where did venom evolve in snakes so in uh, it's actually uh, the, the clade mark here is called toxicophera which includes a group of lizards called anglimorpha lizards and all the snakes in the world so 
Some of them are basal, some of them are advanced. I'll tell you about them in a second. But venom is theorized to have evolved in that common ancestor, right? So you have, I mean, there are many families, just to keep it simple, I'm only talking about the major ones that you might be aware of. So one is called Elapidae, which includes cobras, king cobras, crates, uh, sea snakes, and so on, right? Mambas. Then you have Viperidae, which includes all the vipers, right? The pit vipers, hostel viper, Russell viper, uh, uh, rabbit snakes, and so on. And then you have this family, which people uh, most commonly refer to as non venomous snakes, right? And you also have uh, these basal snakes, which includes uh, lineages like Voidae and Pythonidae, so these are your boas and pythons. But you also have snakes like this, right? The wine snake. So, are there any hepatologists here who can tell me whether it is venomous or semi venomous, right? Or mildly venomous? That's what uh, people commonly uh, refer, to it, uh, refer to it as, right? But as I told you, venom is either used for defense or prey capture or it is not, right? So it can't be, a, I mean, they can't be a gradient. You cannot use venom uh, partially, right? So there is nothing called, there is no gradation. It's a binary trait. So it's like pregnancy, right? You are either pregnant or not. You can't be mildly pregnant or semi-pregnant, right? So why this notion of semi-venomous comes is because when these snakes bite you, um, you know, you will get swelling and sometimes it actually messes up the blood coagulation completely. Very recently, I, um, you know, we worked with clinicians also. So one of the clinicians told me that uh, the bite victim, for months, his blood didn't coagulate properly. Right. So all these things happen internally, which you may not notice most often, but they do have venoms. Um, anyway, so going back to the snake, uh, not this particular snake, which is found in India, but relatives of these snakes called twig snakes, which are medically important. They can actually kill people. But when people looked at the venoms of some of these snakes, they found these toxins called three finger toxins. They are called three fingers because you can see that it looks like three stretched out fingers, right? So these are most important toxins and have been widely studied because they are also abundant in elapids that are medically important, right? So why cobras can kill you is because of this toxin, this toxin alone. Um, so when people found three finger toxins, they were surprised because they didn't expect these guys. I mean, I'm talking about 1950s. Okay, now we know we are not surprised, but at that time, now, people were surprised and when they tested them on uh, mammals like rodents, they found that these were weak, weakly binded, right? So they called them as weak toxins and concluded that's why they are semi-venomous because they can only cause you mild symptoms. But, so obviously, if it doesn't work on rodents, it will not work on humans, including Donald Trump, right? But when the same toxins were tested on birds, they found that it binds almost 200 to 300 times more potently, right? the same way the three finger toxins from cobras would bind to a uh, mammalian child. So that's why it's not a correct notion that they are uh, non venomous Their venoms are potent, but they target the natural prey. Then why are they, I mean, that's not the only reason, right? I mean, the binding is one reason, but the other reason is if you look at the architecture the, of the venom glands as well as the fans, you'll see that, uh, you know, these, uh, some of these snakes, they have fans at the back. Okay, those fans are not as extensive or as, advanced as I will not get into that but yeah these are much more advanced than these many of them are at the back and uh, the fangs can be really elongated so they don't have a very efficient uh, system to inject them and these guys also have this musculature if you look at uh, the muscles in a you know wiper uh, surrounding the venom gland you will be surprised how thick it is so they make use of all those muscles to inject or pump the venom into the prey or the predator very easily right whereas these guys can't but anyway, so like I said, the venom evolves to target the natural prey. So when we look at sauce tail vipers, which are some of the most important, medically important snakes in India, you will see that, so shorter the bar is, more potent the venom is, right? This is LD50. So you will see that compared to another subspecies or, uh, yeah, right now it's a subspecies, um, the venom is really potent against mammals here, whereas the venom of this Saucherix viper is really less potent, right? because one of the prevailing hypotheses is that probably they feed a lot on scorpions, so venom targets them. But if you look at crates, the uh, example becomes even more uh, striking. So this is a common crate, this is one of the most toxic snakes in India, and that's a banded crate which is found in uh, uh, West Bengal. The venom is still toxic, but you can see a huge difference in toxicity, right? And this happens because these snakes don't feed on mammals mostly, they mostly feed on reptiles, right? And then you have this guy uh, called a sinks crate, which is one of which is the mo most toxic snake in India and one of the most toxic snakes in the world because it most likely feeds exclusively on mammals. So when uh, these were given mice in uh, artificial conditions, uh, it was found that they would uh, only pick mice and they won't uh, you know, eat lizards or any other prey items. So 
most likely they feed on mammals. Additional evidence also comes from some of the studies. Uh, in the lab, for example, if you look at, so what we do here is we uh, synthetically prepare the receptor, I mean synthesize the receptor, and we test the ability of the toxin, how efficiently it binds, and how efficiently it dissociates. Okay, so that gives us an idea of whether this toxin is targeting a mammalian prey or a you know, bird prey or so on, right? So we synthesize these receptors from various types of uh, preys and uh, uh, predators like mongooses, crested serpent eagles, honey badgers, and so on. But what you should note here is this is the most toxic snake, like I said. And if you look at this uh, particular uh, graph, which tells us how efficiently they are binding to the rat muscle channels, right? By binding to the muscular channels, they cause paralysis and that's how mammals die, right? So you can see that it binds really efficiently compared to fasciatus, which binds really uh, poorly against the rat channel, right? But it still binds uh, uh, decently, not uh, as poorly as, uh, you know, let's say, uh, this endemanensis, the plate from endemans. But if you look at the binding against snake channels, which is what the banded crate eats, right? And you can clearly see that the banded crate venom binds much more efficiently than, let's say, the syndenus, which doesn't really seem to feed on uh, snakes. So it corroborates these, uh, you know, the findings that we saw earlier in, uh, in terms of feeding experiments. Um, yeah, so the because it binds so efficiently, as I told you, it's one of the most toxic snakes in the world. Uh, you can see how much venom is needed to kill 50% of the wild, you know, the mice population for uh, the brown snake which is found in Australia. Yeah, so we saw that all these three are venomous. What about boas and pythons? Are they venomous? They are not, right? Because they don't make use of venoms to capture prey. But surprisingly, when we looked at the salivas and venom glands, we actually found three different options there. Right? So this shows that Venom did not evolve here 54 million years ago in the common ancestor of advanced snakes, but it actually evolved somewhere here, right? In the common ancestor of all snakes uh, in the world. And uh, we also, I mean, I'll not get into that, but there is evidence that, you know, the venom probably evolved much earlier in the common ancestor of all the, uh, all the snakes in the world, as well as this group called uh, uh, angry morpha lizard, like I said earlier, right? So finding three finite options here was surprising. Now we looked at two different uh, lineages of uh, voids. Okay, one of them was this black red python from Australia, and the other one was the cylindropus. Anyway, so the two lineages are separated by 92 million years of evolutionary history, right? But if you look at the three phyllet toxin sequences, they are almost conserved, right? I mean, there are changes, sure, but um, the conservation is really remarkable, right? If you look at cysteines in particular. As you know, cysteines help in folding of uh, proteins, right? So it's very important for maintaining the structural and functional integrity. Because if you lose structure, obviously you lose function as well, right? So it was very surprising why they are so well conserved. So we thought, you know, they do perform some important function. Maybe not as toxins because, you know, we detected very minimal amounts of this, um, um, you know, toxin homolog in the salivary secretions of boas and pythons. So sure, they don't use venom. But there are lineages in boas and pythons also that repeatedly bite their prey and uh, don't strangulate the prey as much. Okay, so there is a lot of gradation even in terms of uh, whether all of them use venom or not. Right. So one more thing that I wanted to say was, you know, so what happened after this is that somehow they lost this system, and I don't know what happened that probably gave them a really nice confirmation now, but this. Three finger toxin exploded in this in, in terms of molecular evolution, meaning that you know they gave rise to all these very distinct forms, and all these distinct forms target a number of uh, you know receptors just like the cone snails do. So, and all of this happened in the last you know 35 to 50 million years ago, which is in terms of evolutionary biology, you know that uh, it's a very short time, right? So, all of that happened after losing that one particular system. Um, and this also coincides nicely with the evolution of these, you know, the fangs, needle-like fangs, right? These fangs are, so in case of vipers, the fangs are like hypodermic leaves. They are hollow from inside. And as I told you, they have this musculature around the venom gland that squeezes the venom, right? So the moment they evolved these unique or advanced ability to inject venom, it also had a significant impact on the evolution of toxins, right? They exploded and, you know, resulted in all these 
very distinct forms. So you can also see how morphological traits and the molecular traits, uh, uh, you know, co-evolve in the cells. Now, as I told you, cysteines are important for the formation of uh, disulfide bonds. This is what keeps the um, the protein together, right? And if you map evolutionary variation on the surface of uh, you know these uh, toxins, for example, you'll see that most of these variations are located on the molecular surface. So all the regions in red are the ones that are hyper mutating. I should not say hyper mutating, hyper evolving, okay? Because mutation is random and it's not really focused. I mean, in some cases it is, but in most cases it's not really focused, right? It's a selection that filters out variation where it is not required. So. If you look at the evolution of venoms, you'll see that most of these fall outside or most of these hyper variable sites are outside the structurally and functionally important regions, right? Because if, as I said, if you lose the structure or function, then uh, you are losing a very important adaptive trait. And this is a trend that you see in venoms of all kinds of animals, right? From you know spiders to scorpions to vampire bats and uh, snakes and lizards and things. So, and all of these variations are on the outside, right? They are not at the core because as you know, the core is where all these hydrophobic residues are hidden, right? So if you disrupt the core, then you open up the molecule and you lose the conformation completely. So all of these are, uh, uh, you know, located on the molecular surface. And why is this mutation of surface chemistry important? Firstly, it changes the molecule, you know, it introduces novel residues on the surface, which can now interact with novel receptors, right? So imagine a particular animal venturing into a new habitat so if it has a new receptor, it can a new molecule, it can now interact with a new receptor and you know, also gain the ability to target those kinds of animals, right? But it's also useful for other purposes. For example, in vampire bats, as I told you, they feed on the blood, right? So um, they already have many unique mechanisms with which they can disrupt the uh, blood coagulation cascade. But what they do is they often go out close by and feed on livestock, right? And uh, what we proposed is, again, we found that their, mol their venom proteins are also, uh, you know, much more variable compared to salivary proteins in other mammals, like in including humans and rats. And why is this important? Because when they feed on, you know, very similar livestock, and if they don't have any variation, like, uh, you know, our salivary proteins uh, do, then you know the prey can easily immune, uh, you know, mount an immune response, right? Which would uh, disable their salivary secretions. And so the vampire bats rely on stealth, right? So you might have heard that they have these really sharp incisors with which they make a cut, and the animal doesn't even notice, right? And then they start uh, licking the wound and salivating on the wound, and this is where they introduce all these very different types of proteins. Some of them are apparently neuroparalytic in the sense it causes local anesthesia, so the animal doesn't even know that it's uh, being fed on. And of course, it has lots of anticoagulants, which prevents the blood from clotting completely, right? But as I said, we found a lot of variation in vampire bat uh, venoms, and uh, that, again, probably helps in evading this immune response or probably delaying the response, right? If all of them were very conserved, like I said, in us, in us the venoms would have, uh, the, the animal could have easily mounted an, a response and all these other adaptive traits would be rendered uh, inert, right? I mean, because the animal would now know that it's being fed on. Now, venoms are not always, you know, diversifying, right? They're also highly conserved. So, for example, if you look at venoms of um, um, animals that uh, make use of venom for uh, defense, right? Not for prey capture, but defense. There, you don't really need a lot of variety. You want to evolve components that can target a wide variety of uh, uh, channels, right? Because you don't, firstly, you don't use venom as often as uh, in, in terms of predation. And secondly, you want to target a conserved region that is, you know, found across the uh, animal kingdom and cause a lot of pain. You don't want to kill your predator either, right? Because if your predator dies, then it doesn't learn. So you want to, you know, make it remember, and the best way of doing that is by causing, uh, uh, you know, immense pain. But interestingly, so these are funnel web spiders that are found in Australia. These are uh, some of the only spiders that can kill you. Most other spiders can cause clinical uh, significant envenoming, but they don't really, uh, they, they are not really fatal. But uh, funnel web, uh, funnel web spider venoms are. 
Um, so, so they do that with the help of these toxins called delta toxins. And as the name says, the delta, it targets sodium channels, right? So it's neuroparalytic. So when we looked at the venoms of funnel web spiders from around, uh, you know, all across their uh, phylogeny, uh, I'm only showing a few, uh, you know, few sequences here, but the alignment had a uh, lot many sequences. Um, so I should tell you again that the regions that are, um, you know, uh, highly variable are the ones that are in red. So you can see that there are very few of these sites, uh, and this will become much more apparent when we see, you know, the evolution of venoms in other lineages. But long story short, what we see here is that the venoms are a lot more conserved than you would see, for, um, you know, uh, in venoms of other other lineages. So we theorize that the venoms are mostly used for defense. And uh, I'll not get into the details, but uh, long story short, what what uh, it turns out that maybe they are also fatal to humans because of an evolutionary accident. You know, they probably targeted a mammal in Australia that uh, uh, you know had very similar. Uh, I mean, it has very similar channels to us, right? So they evolved venoms at that time to target that mammal, and because our channels are very conserved, so it's an evolutionary accident why they can kill people. And if you have heard of funnel spiders, you know that the males come out of, come out of the burrows and they start wandering around, right? Uh, during the breeding season, that's when they encounter humans and accidental envenomments happen, and that's when people die. So, um, the there are other spiders that make use of venoms for uh, you know for ca capturing prey. For example, the bird spiders, they make use of venoms to capture birds, right? I mean. Lots of other things, including birds. Um, so they use venoms for defense, uh, offense, right? And they have evolved relatively recently. So um, what Naim found out um, uh, is that you know some of these toxins, in contrast to the venoms that are used for defense, are rapidly evolving. You know, so you can see a lot more positively selected sites and the omega values. So evolutionary rates are always measured in something called omega value, right? So it's basically so how do you define evolution? It's basically a rate of change, right, or change over time, right? So when you look at sequences, you can count how many changes are. So you have nucleotides that uh, code for the same amino acids, right? So you can have. So not all changes at the nucleotide are going to change the amino acid, correct? So you you have something called a codon redundancy. So you can figure out how many of those changes have happened that change the amino acids versus the changes at the nucleotide level that don't change the amino acid, right? So by calculating the relative proportion, you will know how fast or slow a gene is evolving. So if a gene is extremely important, you will see very fewer of those replacement changes, right? If, um, if a gene is adaptive and variation is necessary, then you will see a lot of those replacement changes. And in this case, you, you did see a lot of uh, replacement changes. Now, in terms of evolution, you know that you don't see conservation only at the molecular level, but also at the morphological level, right? Do you guys know what this is? It's a, it's a silicon, right? So, the first silicon, a washed up dead silicon, was found in 1938, okay? And uh, people were very surprised because it's, it's uh, you know, it has not changed um, since the dawn of the dinosaurs. So basically, it, was, it is believed to have gone extinct 65 million years ago, around the same time when the dinosaurs uh, got extinct. But if you look at, so there are three different lineages, I'll not get into that. One of them was this, um, Mausonia, which weighed uh, you know around 600 kilograms, uh, favorite food of all these uh, uh, sea dwelling uh, reptiles. But if you look at some of these fossil records, and if you compare the silicons that exist today, it, it looks identical, okay? So it has not changed much at all. So that's why they're called living fossils, right? Because they don't, morphologically, they're not uh, that divergent. But it's not, it doesn't really reflect uh, or capture the evolution uh, very accurately. Although morphologically, they seem very, um, you know, similar at the molecular level, at the genomic level, there are lots of changes that happen, okay? So, yeah, they are also called missing links, right? Because uh, they, uh, I mean, they have these things with which they can walk. I mean, they are found around volcanic, uh, um, you know, volcanic. What do you call them? Mountains or something under the ocean, right? So they are no normally found around uh, there, and they can walk on uh, using these things. So that's why they are called missing link links, right? Between fish and uh, terrestrial animals. But you also have these today, right? Do you do you guys know what is that? Sorry. 
mud skippers, right? So they do come out of water, and there are many, many such fish. But yeah, people do call, like to call them as missing links. So to tell you that molecular, I mean, although these living fossils uh, appear very similar, there are lots of changes that happen at the molecular level. Um, so one such living fossil is called uh, sol solenodon. So this is basically um, an insectivore. Um, so they are really big. They make use, they are venomous, otherwise I won't be talking about it, right? So they have these fangs uh, with which they inject venom. So there are four different lineages of, uh, um, uh, you know, in this, they belong to this uh, order called Eulipotifla. So there are uh, many lineages under this. One of them is the Solenidon. So they are found in Cuba and Hispaniola and they are endangered, right? And again, they are called living fossils because if you look at their fossils and compare the morphology of the existing Solenidons, they are extremely well conserved, right? But what is interesting is that these guys are venomous and then there are other members also that are venomous or are thought to uh, be venomous. So this mesopontid, which has gone extinct now, it also has teeth which is like grooved, right? So people believe that probably they were also venomous, but they are gone extinct, so we don't know what happened there. Then you have these shrews, which are also venomous. Uh, not all of them, some of them are. So they, these shrews are capable of, uh, you know, even feeding on snakes, for example. They are ferocious and they can feed, feed on anything. And they have very potent venoms too. So it was very interesting to figure out, uh, you know, whether they, uh, the venom evolved here in the common ancestor and then there were like multiple losses or whether venom evolved independently once here, uh, second maybe here, here and here, right? So when you look at the diet composition, you can see that they mostly feed on you know, a variety of animals, but mostly on uh, amphibians, right? Amphibians, and then you have birds, different types of birds, and then you have these uh, lizards. So we collected the venom and saliva separately. So how do you do that? So you can put a pipette back at the mouth of the solenidon. You will mostly get saliva, right? If there is no distinction between venom and saliva, you would figure that out in downstream experiments, right? And how do you um, collect the venom? You make them bite into a plastic tubing and that's how you collect the saliva and venom separately. Like I said, if there was no difference, you would not see any difference uh, in downstream experiments. But here is a simple SKS state, so you can see the venom uh, here and uh, the saliva here, right? Yeah. So, and you can clearly see the difference between the venom and saliva. The venom seems to be rich in this particular band which later turns out to be uh, you know, a type of uh, Kunix inhibitor. And the venom also seems to be a lot more streamlined, right? I mean, very less uh, saliva was loaded, so you can't see, but there are multiple bands here. Whereas venom seems to be, you know, uh, mostly made up of a couple of uh, components. So it turns out to be a calicrine. Um, these are a type of serine proteases. They are also found in humans, which I'll tell you. And there are 15 paralogs in all placental mammals, including us. So when the activities were tested, it became very clear that you know the conids are uh, they do have this uh, catalytic activity and they target uh, plasminogen. So this is again one of the most important component in your blood. By targeting this, you can mess up the coagulation cascade, and you can also cause a lot of uh, uh, you know um, significant effects on the blood pressure, right? Which I'll tell you in a second. And uh, the activity seems to be a lot more potent than even some of the snake venom. Uh, uh, you know, calicrines. Snakes and lizards have calicrines too, which I'll tell you in a second again. Um, so what we found out, long story short, is that it has a huge depressor effect on mammals. Okay. So what does this mean? It causes a huge dip in the blood pressure the moment the solenidon bites a particular mammal. It's the same strategy that is used by Komodo dragons. So Komodo dragons, as you know, you know, uh, people think that they are poisonous and you know they bite uh, these water buffaloes which then later die of infection and they enter ponds and all but uh, all of that is bs they have venom and uh, they do have something similar to calicrine which causes a huge dip in the blood pressure and the animal drops the moment uh, you know it gets bitten um, yeah so it's very similar to uh, you know the action of komodo dragon causes hypertension but what is more interesting is that uh, you know when you look at the evolution of calicrines in across mammals, you see that the calicrines that were found in the saliva of uh, solenodons, they are found in the same clade as calicrines of other mammals, including the venomous shrews, okay? and of course all other uh, eulipotifla. 
Another interesting thing is that all these calibrates, all the paralogs that we found, they found in a single subcluster. Right? What does this tell us? Can you figure out? I mean, does it matter if it is found in the same clade or if it is spread all across? What will it say if it is found, all those paralogs are found in the same clade? Sorry? Sorry? Monophyletic. Uh, yeah, I mean, they are paralogs, sure. But what, what does it tell you about the evolution? Right, so we are looking at calipreens in shoes, and all those sequences are found in the same clade. Right? Duplication, yeah, paralogs. Sorry? Recently evolved. Uh, yeah, excellent point, right? So what it says is that it has evolved once independently, right? If it was there in the common ancestor, then all these calicreens would be spread all across the tree, right? So you should always look for uh, these things in phylogenetic trees. So all of them are found in the same plate, which says that this is a recent duplication event and not an ancestral event, right? Uh, yeah, so all those uh, resulted from lineage specific uh, gene uh, duplications and not the duplication didn't happen prior to the diversification of these lineages. Now, we also sequenced the genome and looking into the genome further provided evidence for this, right? So, why you need to look into genomes is because you can perform something called a synteny analysis, right? So, you look at the region of the chromosome that contains these genes across animals. And then, so let's say that uh, you know, in the in the venom, we found seven different calipreens, right? It's possible that human genome also has those copies, but maybe they are not expressed in the saliva. Maybe we only express one calipreen, right? So to rule that uh, uh, you know fact out, what you can do is you can look at the genome, and it's very clear that you know, in addition to those fifteen paralogs. The, uh, the solenodons also have these uh, you know, lineage specific duplications which don't exist anywhere else. So this shows that they have um, you know, duplicated this calicreen for some reason. Can you tell me why did they duplicate it? What was the need to duplicate it? When do you duplicate a particular gene? What is the end product of duplication? Sorry? Dosage. Exactly, right? So, overexpression. If you want more of something, you can either tweak the regulatory mechanisms and overexpress something, over translate something, or you could just have multiple copies of the same thing, right? So, that's exactly what they do. They, they have these multiple uh, rounds of duplications which resulted in multiple copies, so it increases the expression. Uh, remember, I told you that they are also found in human saliva, right? But they they have evolved differently and they overexpress because they are important for capturing a prey or you know, deterring a predator, right? So coming back to the question of where did this particular uh, uh, you know trait evolve, right? Did it evolve in the common ancestor or did it evolve uh, independently? So Vivek sitting here can tell you more about this. I'll just uh, skim over the you know. So what he did is he performed ancestral state reconstruction to figure out whether it was a common, what is the probability that the venom evolved here versus you know, at these tips, right? And it turns out that the venom has evolved on at least four different occasions. Once in Neomis shows, once in Blerina shows, then it's Crocidura, and then once in the common ancestor of Solinarans, okay? So this represents in just one lineage or in just one order, you know, there are four independent uh, you know, origins of venom. So this is this represents the largest uh, uh, known case uh, of independent evolution in a single order thus far. So you can see how important this trait is, right? So very, I mean, they are related, but they have all evolved these traits independently. And as you saw in the first tree, the venom has evolved over hundred times. So it shows how important this trait can be for the diversification of various lineages of animals. Um, a couple of last examples before I end. So, um, you know that scorpions and uh, sea anemones. So, sea anemones, if you have seen uh, Finding Nemo, right? So, um, the, clown, the clownfish hides behind this uh, 
grass like thing right so that's not a plant that's actually an animal uh, it's called a sea anemone right so they belong to the same uh, phylum as uh, uh, the jellyfish um, hydra right and corals right? so they have these unique cells called stinging cells like i said earlier and uh, they use this uh, to inject venom and you have scorpions that also inject venom with stingers and both of them use venom for prey capture right i mean they also use venom for defense these guys also use venom for uh, defense sometimes but here it's mostly about you know capturing prey in in terms of uh, sea anemones they feed on these larvae insect larvae they feed on fish larvae they feed on larger fish there are cases of you know large sea anemones feeding on birds they don't really go out and capture birds but you know birds that fall into the uh, ocean uh, people have seen you know them feeding on uh, them as well as i said you know defensive venoms evolve slowly offensive venoms mostly evolve rapidly right so won't you expect that you know these the venoms in these guys also to evolve rapidly but if you look at scorpions you know one is found here the other is found here right i mean you can say that you can go like this but for scorpions it's that's a really large distance right they can't really travel through boats right and uh, same thing for uh, sea anemones i mean they might be found close by but the, they are so, such small animals that dispersal rate is really short right so they can't really travel uh, too long but if you look at the, some of their most important toxins they seem to be almost identical right so look at this particular toxin in uh, sea anemones here and here and they can't really travel like this because they are also sensitive to temperature and so many other things in the ocean in the ocean right so there is only one point mutation in uh, the most important toxin they express right and is the same thing uh, if you look at and there are many other examples like i said in scorpions in uh, sea anemones and many other animals so it was very surprising why these venoms are so conserved right it goes against our understanding of uh, uh, predatory venoms so what we realized is that you know you need to look at them from an evolutionary perspective right so if you look at uh, sea anemones these are some of the first venomous animals that evolved around 700 million years ago right whereas you have these guys that only evolved around 400 million years ago so that's octopus cuttlefish and squid yes they are also venomous they make use of venom to capture uh, mollusks and uh, other animals and of course you have centipedes spiders and scorpions they also evolved around 400 million years ago and as i said the advanced snakes and these guys they evolved only in the last 35 to 50 million years ago and you know that's a huge gap right so you can call these as evolutionarily ancient and these are evolutionarily young and you know unlike other traits so for example you might argue that you know a particular trait in us was there long time ago so it has evolved for such a long time but in case of venoms that is not true right these venoms have evolved independently as you saw so these are all origins in these groups right there was the common ancestor of uh, um, snail and a cone snail was not venoms right so in terms of traits these are evolutionarily young traits they are old so again like i said what uh, i did is uh, we looked at uh, you know the um, um, we calculated omega values for various toxins you know large number of toxins that are there in uh, uh, these different groups of animals and we saw whether they are evolving rapidly or whether they are conserved right so each dot here represents a particular amino acid position and the color represents you know different toxin families so there are i can't see it's a very bad figure i think there are 15 bars i guess right so there are 15 different families in uh, centipedes and uh, you know this represents a line of neutrality so anything above it means uh, that they are evolving rapidly anything below it means they are conserved and these larger globes right i mean circles so they represent uh, you know positively selected sites meaning these are the sites that are hyper variable there is a lot of statistical confidence to say that these are evolving rapidly but i can't say the same for these right so you should only look for these how many of these are there in uh, you know these lineages so if you look at centipedes or cnidarians or any other animal that i said earlier cuttlefish octopus squids right uh, spiders so you will see that there are very few of these uh, you know red circles in contrast if you look at advanced snakes see how many there are right and look at cone snakes right so the trend was very clear that somehow the old or ancient lineages seem to be a lot more conserved than the lineages that are evolutionarily young right so 697 uh, positively selected sites statistically which you can statistically uh, confidently say that it, they are positively selected what's the 41 in all these lineages right so why does this happen this happens because of 
something called a two speed mode of evolution so basically if you think of uh, uh, sea snakes and sea crates right so the snakes in uh, oceans so they are descendants of terrestrial snakes right so basically they are related to crates and cobras on land and those ventured out into water and became sea crates and sea snakes right so these guys were feeding on mammals they were feeding on birds amphibians lizards right and they went into oceans they didn't have any of those they had fish so the venoms that they had previously were not really useful right so they had they have to rapidly evolve these venoms now in order to capture these you know new type of prey or to deter the new types of predators that they encounter here right and this is where they experience something called a period of expansion right so if there is a significant shift in ecology or environment you need to rapidly evolve your venom right you need to generate a whole suite of uh, venoms that can target different receptors and only then you would be successful in uh, conquering that new niche right so this is called a period of expansion but imagine what happens if you keep mutating your genes right i mean venom coding genes you might accumulate a mutation that will render your toxin inert right i mean you will lose activity so that's an adaptive trait again like i said so that has a huge consequence so you can't keep mutating your genes all the time so once you have generated enough toxins that are efficient enough to target various prey and uh, predators you don't really need to mutate them uh, anymore right so they go through a period of purification and fixation where all these variations are wiped out and you um, only are left with genes that are like very well conserved but as you know ecology and evolution they are never constant right they are always changing so if there is a significant shift then this goes back into a period of expansion and this thing happens so remember the example of the spiders that i said the spiders that evolved 160 million years ago they are very well conserved but the ones that evolved in the last 50 million years that are also using venoms for uh, predation are rapidly evolving right so this is something that you see in many animals and that's what you call a period of uh, one last example and then i'll stop this here and evolution is not rand i mean um, mutations are random but evolution is not right uh, maybe i should give some more clarity um, so you don't really see variation all across a particular protein right variations are often needed in a particular region of interest okay so i'll give you an example of this so you know how proteins are expressed in most vertebrates right or in most animals right so they have a signal peptide they have a pro peptide and this is the one that actually performs the function right so this is called a mature peptide so what happens is the signal peptide is needed to carry this protein from the site of expression to the site of delivery right so that's the job of that so once it's taken to the site of delivery it is cleaved off then you have pro peptide which helps in folding of the protein right so once a protein is folded in fact once this is cleaved the protein starts folding properly right so pro peptide is important for the proper folding of protein but at the end of the day this is what performs the function and if you look at any of our proteins this is what you'll see you'll not see it in, uh, this in most genes and you'll not see this in uh, you know in the end product at all right but what is interesting is that if you look at uh, there is a a toxin called uh, svmp or snake venom metallomer protein is so this also has a signal peptide a pro peptide and a mature domain so mature domain here is composed of three different domains sub domains these are very important for you know causing you know messing up your blood or uh, you know being highly necrotic and so on we will not get into that but remember that these three domains are very important okay and these are mostly enriching the venoms of uh, vipers such as saw scale vipers or this bites but interestingly another lineage of snake uh, it's it's not a colubrid earlier they were all called colubrids right but this is actually a lamprophid it's a sand snake right that you find in arid regions mostly so this guy also produces svmps but what is interesting is that it doesn't express any of these it only produces this and that okay and when we look at the venom the venom seems to be rich in this the pro peptide so why would something produce a pro peptide in its venom right i mean you need this so if you don't have this there is no point in spending your energy in making that right so we looked at three different lineages of these one uh, these are saw scale vipers so in case of uh, you know this particular species of saw scale viper as i told you it expresses all the domains signal peptide pro peptide and the three domains right 
But there are other soft scale wipe, uh, wipers, which in addition to this, also produce this unique thing that is found in this lamp rupert. Okay, They also produce signal peptide and pro-peptide. But here you could argue that maybe there was a mutation that was found in you know that uh, deletion basically of these domains. So this is not doing anything, right? Because it also expresses the important domains in its venom, right? So if you look at the evolution, you would expect that these three would evolve much more rapidly because they are very important for you know exhibiting those toxicities like I explained, right? And it does, uh, and then in this case, like I said, it doesn't need to evolve at all, right? I mean, it could be just. Uh, following neutral evolution and in this case it's I mean it's interesting to see what happens here but if you look at the evolution here again like I said the omega values are really large which means that you know they are evolving very rapidly as you as you would expect in this case there is they are not evolving rapidly at all because like I said signal peptides and pro-peptides are extremely well conserved because if you change the signal peptide then your protein will not be delivered at a correct location if you change this, it will not fold properly, right? So these have to be conserved. And if you look at any signal peptide or pro-peptide coding gene in humans or any other animals, they are conserved. So this is not surprising. But what is interesting is that this pro-peptide also seems to be evolving under positive selection. You know? It also seems to be under you know, this Darwinian evolution. Why is that? Because this is the only thing that they produce. And when we look at the activity, it turns out that this is one of, it has turned into a neurotoxin. So something that is completely useless, or I shouldn't say useless, it's important for structural integrity, but something that is not really, uh, you know, doesn't really exhibit any function, right? That has been weaponized by these snakes into, uh, you know, a potent neurotoxin. And that has again happened because of this rapid evolution that you see here. So you should also remember that uh, evolution can act on particular regions based on their uh, biochemical function or, uh, you know, ecological relevance. And yeah, I will end my talk here and I'll be happy to answer any question. Yeah, so if we look at the evolution of it, it has evolved in multiple lineages every day. So if we look up on the elements of prey, it seems like in the tree of life there is only gain of this prey. No, actually that's uh, yeah, that's a very good point. I, I agree that that tree doesn't really convey the losses, but there have been multiple losses. In fact, uh, some statisticians have shown that evolution of this trait has actually uh, resulted in extension of many uh, lineages because it's a very expensive trait, right? You need to produce a lot of toxins, different types of toxins. You need to invest in your regulatory mechanisms. So it is an expensive trait. Um, and yeah, there are multiple losses also. Yeah, in snakes, for example, boas and pythons. So the venom of the common ancestor did have all of that. But boas and pythons and many lineages didn't really go that way, right? They wanted to, they didn't really rely on venom. They relied on constriction more, right? So, uh, yeah. so I was thinking about boas and pythons. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know about potency. Nobody has tested it, but that's very interesting. But like I said, you know, we only looked at a couple of them. There is such a whole suite of those uh, organisms, right? It's possible that some of them might be expressing three finger toxins in large amounts and maybe they do exhibit some bioactivity. Like I said, you know, not all of them rely on constriction, right? Many of them do bite repeatedly and don't really rely on strang uh, strangulation as much. So uh, it's possible that some of them still use venom, but yeah, that, but yeah, it's an evolutionary relic, right? I mean, it's there in the saliva. Um, one of the things is that these have to be overexpressed in the saliva, right? So the promoters have to be really strong. So you will also see expression of some of these toxins in physiological tissues like heart, like ovaries, like you know something that's completely unrelated. So that's called a leaky expression. So the prom promoters are so strong that the expression leaks into other physiological tissues. So something like that could be also happening in boas and pythons. So what about the snakes? Yeah. They are in the population. Hmm. So then, if I classify, you can do one that purely uh, looking for maybe not scientific, but cold-blooded animals. Okay. And the others, they are looking for more cold-blooded and non-blooded animals. Okay. So in that case, theoretically, uh, the snakes which are looking for more cold-blooded animals, mm -hmm. they should inject uh, less venom 
and uh, why do you say that? less protein compared to the one right? Why do you say that if a snake is feeding on crocodiles? I mean, then the mouth part comes to the answer, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are lots of adaptations that are required, but I'm just saying, why do you think, you know, cold blooded animals, if they're targeting cold blooded animals, why would they require less venoms? It's comparatively easier, right? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to understand. Why, why do you think it's easier to catch a cold blooded animal versus a. I mean, shoes, for example, right? Some of them run like crazy. So, uh, you, you might actually want to kill them faster than you know cold blooded animals, which are dependent on the external temperature. But again, you also have examples of reptiles that can run really quick. So, I mean, I don't. Uh, maybe I didn't understand the question correctly. Why do you think it's very easy to capture cold blooded animals? You know, I'm asking, my question is that is there any differentiation between the. Venom in venom, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you are ca- capturing, uh, so if you look at cobras, right? What do what do you think cobras feed on? Rats. Rats, right? It turns out that the venoms are as potent against mammals as they are against lizards. Okay, at least the binding of the toxins to the channels, right? So probably they also feed on lizards, or it could be because of the resistance and. But yeah, you you do see this specificity depending on what they are feeding on, whether it's cold blood. There is also evolution of other traits, right? For example, if you look at uh, the uh, rattlesnakes, they have something called a pit, right? That's why they're called pit vipers. So it has evolved to capture uh, warm-blooded animals, right? It can see in infrared, so it can see on the darkest of nights. And you don't see that in animals that only or exclusively feed on cold-blooded animals. So, um, so yeah, you do see a difference, but not as cold-blooded or warm-blooded, but depending on what kind of animal they're feeding. And uh, with the sea snake and the uh, terrestrial snakes, hmm. so I mean, compared to the venom, I mean, there should be more. Uh, sea snakes should have specialized more in biting right? compared to the uh, you know venom for tenancy. No, not biting. I mean, the venoms are. I mean, they are some of the most potent snakes. You know, the venoms are really potent. Even against mammals for some reason, but that's probably because you know the split has happened very recently in terms of evolutionary time scale. Uh, but yeah, I mean the venoms have to evolve to capture fish, right? So one other interesting thing is that if you look at sea snakes, they mostly feed on one type of fish or the other, right? They don't really feed on you know mammals, amphibians, birds, reptiles, as terrestrial snakes do. So if you look at the venom profiles, so if you look at a profile of a terrestrial snake. You will see that you know it has all these really large bars because you know like HPLC, right? You will see a lot of fractions with different components. But if you look at sea snake venom, they are mostly streamlined. They only express one or two of those. Why? Again, because they only feed on one type of fish or the other. Right? So yeah, you do see variation depending on all these uh, very complex you know, factors. And snakes, saliva. Yeah. Saliva. Venom is a modified saliva in this snake. But now, like. Uh, when I uh, tell about saliva, excluding venom, huh. uh, saliva uh, in the snake, which is not venomous, huh. then the saliva oh. should be more. Uh, no, no, just to clarify, so if you look at the cobras or vipers, right? The saliva is the venom. There is no anything else. They don't uh, really produce anything else because they produce, it's a mod- modified uh, salivary gland. Right? So the secretion is directly pumped into the fang and it gets injected. But you are right that in some of these old world snakes, uh, not old world snakes, the uh, basal lineages of snakes, you do have other glands like the rectal glands and all those. They also produce venom, but not in large amounts, but they are mostly evolved to produce mucus and other things. So if you look at animals that, uh, snakes that are uh, medically important, they mostly produce saliva, the venom. If you look at boas and pythons, they mostly express this mucus, which helps in lubricating the prey and you know, engulfing the prey. Easily. Yeah, you see differences that way. Yeah, any other questions? Okay. Um, see, in terms of cone snake, so we found that they have, I mean, cone snake is not a good example, but again, let's go back to that uh, solid one, right? 
So it, it doesn't really need to produce or salivate venom all the time, right? So uh, it only uses venom when, when it's uh, biting a prey or a predator, right? So we have seen that in certain animals, they have control over what they're injecting. So they can express a particular part of their uh, salivary gland to express a particular cocktail of toxin, depending on whether they are, for example, in constant, if they're feeding on fish, they produce one cocktail, if they're depending themselves on what is it they produce another type of cocktail. So similarly in solid on 